Luke chapter 1, in, uh, beginning in verse 26. Uh, hopefully you guys had a, a great Thanksgiving with friends and with family. Uh, some of you kept it probably small, others maybe really big. And, uh, and then after Thanksgiving, after the, the turkey comatose started to wear off and, and the football games started to get re- repeating and old and boring, uh, some of you probably went out to this, this Black Friday thing. Now, I personally avoided that. I did it one time in my life, and uh, it was a mistake I don't think I'll ever try to make again. Uh, but, but a lot of people head out, right? They go out to this thing. In fact, this year they started like literally after Thanksgiving. The, the clock, I mean, you finish dinner and they are, the stores are opening and, uh, and it's a great time to just, right after you give thanks, go out and try to pummel somebody for an iPad, right? And so, I mean, it's amazing our culture that, that, that how quickly we, we take this, this holiday designed to give thanks and appreciation for everything and then we immediately slam it with all of the Western consumerism that we can possibly imagine. And if, and if Thanksgiving is a problem, uh, then, then Christmas is an epidemic. Christmas is a crisis in our culture. That that we have so lost the true story of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas. It has been covered by so much other stuff. And and really, even as Christians, we 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 kind of have a, a veneer of of the true Christmas story. We we kind of we, we make it look better than it really is. We try to add all this stuff in it and it becomes this kind of oh holy night and all these, you know, quiet away in a manger. Everything was quiet. And, and really when you look at the Christmas story in the scripture, you see that these are real people living real lives in real places. And, and, and it's amazing as you begin to look at it just how, how challenging all of the circumstances were surrounding that. This morning, the story we're going to look at is the story of the promise of Jesus to Mary. And hopefully, through the eyes of Luke, the the historian, the doctor, maybe you'll learn some new things. Maybe you'll see it just in a little bit of a different story. Maybe you'll get a little bit of a different picture of Mary than maybe you've had in the past. We're so grateful that, that Luke has written us this account. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you remember Luke wrote this. He was a doctor. He was one who traveled with the Apostle Paul. And he was writing to a man named Theophilus, who was a, a friend of his in some sort, and was probably either a new believer or one who had yet, not yet come to faith in Christ, but was on the path. So it was a, a pre-Christian in a sense. And he is writing to him to bolster his confidence and his faith and his understanding of who Jesus was and what Jesus did to help him understand that the faith that he believed in was grounded in reality and in truth, that there really was a a, a God who had come to earth and who had died for humanity for their salvation. And so we pick up this week in verse 26 of chapter one. Look at it with me. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month, 
with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Father, God, I pray that you would uh, just speak to us this morning through your word, that your Holy Spirit would open up our hearts and our lives. God, you know exactly what each person in this room is going through. You know what they're encountering, what they're dealing with, and you know exactly what you want to say to them this morning, Lord. I don't, I, I know what you've shown me in your word, but God, I pray that through the power of your spirit this morning, God, that you would speak to the hearts and the lives of people. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for it being the truth that we can stand upon to know what you would have us know this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, the the story that we come to here is really the second part of a two-part scenario that's taking place in the book of Luke. And if you were with us last week, we saw the first part. And the first part was the, there was the announcement of John the Baptist to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, and now we get the second part. And, and if you read these two parts together as they're kind of designed or intended to be read together, you'll notice that there are a lot of similarities between these two stories. You'll notice that there were two announcements by the same angel. There were two people told not to be afraid. There were two miracles that were pro, uh, promised, uh, births that were promised. There were two names that were given of who these young men were to be called and two purposes given to which these men would live their lives. And so you see a lot of similarities, but, but the reality is here, Luke's point is not so much the similarities, but really the differences. He wants us to notice the similarities, but in that to realize that there are very significant differences between the announcement of John and the announcement of Jesus. You see, where John was great before the Lord... Jesus is great because he is the Lord. Where John's birth was miraculous, it had been done before. Somebody that had been past the age of childbearing had conceived and and given birth. Hannah had had done that and and Sarah had done that. God had done that before, but, but Jesus was completely unique and new. Never was a, had a virgin uh, given birth to a child. Where John would be a prophet, Jesus would be Lord and King over all. See, no matter what you get this morning, don't miss this. That the point of this story is that Jesus is absolute. That he is superior. That he is over all. All. Where, whereas John was the greatest man ever to be born to live among the earth, Jesus was even greater because he was God in the flesh. That's Luke's point. So let's look at this promise of the birth of the king. And there are some very significant things that I want to bring out to you, help you understand that, that, that this story tells us and shows us about the gospel, or about the good news of Jesus Christ. And the first is this. The gospel is centered in humility. The gospel is centered in humility. We see that, we know that throughout the rest of Scripture. We see that in the life of Jesus Christ. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, where Paul points out that Jesus was the chief Uh, example of humility for us. Verse 5 of chapter 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. And it begins even at this announcement of his birth. Verse 26, in the sixth month, 
the angel Gabriel was sent to God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, the sixth month refers to the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. This is a real time, a real place, and a real date. See, see, Luke is very concerned about details because he's writing to Theophilus to say, Theophilus, if you want to go back and check on these details, here are the times, here are the places, and here are the people. This isn't a make-believe once upon a time story. This is this happened on this day to these people in this place. The angel Gabriel, that was the one we learned about last week. He was the archangel that was given specific, special announcements to give to, to God's people. He's only uh, appeared a few times. Only two angels are actually given names in the scripture, and Gabriel is one of them. So when he shows up, you know, it's a pretty important announcement. In the city of Galilee, named Nazareth. Now, when you and I read that, it doesn't really mean a whole lot to us because it's just like every other location that we read about in Scripture. We have, to, we have to do some research that we could even understand what these places are. We've heard Nazareth before, but, but if you lived in this time, at this place, that city of Nazareth would see, would, you might have to even ask, like, where is that? Or, or where, what are you talking about? Because Nazareth was such a small, nowhere village. It probably consisted of maybe 50 to 100 people at the time of Christ. God chooses the most nowhereville out in the, just nothing important comes out of Nazareth. In fact, there's a statement in John 146. Nathaniel says to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says, come, meet Jesus. He came from, he's Jesus of Nazareth. And Philip goes like, what? Or Nathaniel goes, what? Are you, Nazareth? What are you talking about? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. In the region of Galilee, and Galilee was far removed from Jerusalem, beginning towards the Gentile lands. And so it had, you know, Gentiles had kind of creeped into that land. There was Roman soldiers in occupation. And, and Jews didn't, I mean, they looked down on Galilee, let alone Nazareth. I mean, Nazareth is nowhere. It's like, you know, it's like when you're driving north and you're heading up to Spokane and there's just nothing, right? There's nothing, 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 nothing. And then all of a sudden you hit Biggs, right? And you're like, oh, look, there's a, what is this place? And, and then you're out of there, right? They, like, there's a gas station and a subway and there's a little collection of people that, they live there. They call that home. And it, when you drive through those places, maybe it's like Antelope or Biggs or, or there's a place called Fossil. I just discovered that. You know, you discover these places, you drive through these places and, and you're like, wow, there's a population of small, very, very small, small population of people that live there. And what is it that happens when you drive through those places? If you're me, you go, wow, I'm so thankful that I do not live here. I mean, that's just personally honest. That is what I say. I would say, wow, I am, they're amazed that there are people out here. I am so thankful I'm not one of them. That was Nazareth. Nazareth was nothing. Nowhereville. This would be like somebody saying, hey, the, 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 the king of all kings has been born in fossil. Right? And people are like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? That was Nazareth. Not Jerusalem. Not Rome. Not any of the large cities, but this nowhereville. Because God, from the very, very beginning, is teaching us something about the gospel. And that is the gospel is centered in humility. But it, but it goes on, right? He says, he, says he was uh, uh, to, to named as to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph. Now, now, before we even are introduced to Mary, twice Luke tells us that she was a virgin. He is emphasizing something. He is pointing something out to us. He is trying to make sure that we get this. Now, Luke was a medical doctor, and so, so he understood what this meant. And, and he probably asked those kind of questions and maybe even talked to, can I talk to her doctor? Can I, can I, can I find out this information? This was, this was such a miracle to, to make sure that, that he got this right, to understand this. And so he emphasizes this point to us. A, a virgin who was betrothed. Now, betrothal 
is like our idea of engagement, but way, way different. So take kind of your idea of engagement. Somebody gets engaged, and it's, it's a whole new level. In this culture, betrothal was actually a kind of a legal agreement. Uh, parents would uh, decide who their children were allowed to marry. See, we should go back to that, don't you think? But children, <laughs> parents were allowed to decide who their children would marry. They would find a, a good Jewish boy and, and, and pair them up. And then there would be a dowry that would be promised. And, and there would be parents that would agree and they would sign on on this. And then before the rabbi, and before the community, there would be a ceremony. I mean, almost like a wedding. There would be a ceremony where there would be an agreement and a betrothal to one another. And this was a legal period that would last uh, usually about a year long. And during that year, the wife would prepare for the marriage and prepare for the wedding. Uh, and, and, the, and the husband would prepare, f prepare the home. And this was a, a legal binding contract. And, and the only way that you could get out of, of a betrothal would be much like a marriage would either be divorce or death or adultery. It was a legal binding contract. It wasn't like something you could just leave if you wanted to. And so they were involved in this betrothal period, this legal period together. And, and she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Now, surprisingly, we don't know a whole lot about Joseph. We know a few things. <laughs> we know that God entrusted his very son to this earthly father. So, so there must have been some... some uh, some character involved in this man, Joseph, and in this young woman, Mary. But we don't know a whole lot about him. We know he was poor. We know because of the, the offering that they used in the, to, for the sacrifice was the offering of poor people. And so Joseph and Mary were poor, and they were from poor families. And Joseph was a carpenter. He worked a, a manual labor job, and it was probably uneducated and uh, probably uh, just lived in, in that small town. It was a, what you have to picture here is it, it's a poor family in a very rural area just living life, trying to be faithful and obedient to God. But he was of the family and the lineage of the house of David, and that was important because Jesus had to come from the lineage of David. Most scholars believe that both Mary some was connected to the lineage of David and, and, and Joseph was definitely connected to the lineage of David. We, we see that right here. And then he says, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now we are introduced here to Mary. Now, most of your nativity scenes and things like that, uh, probably most of those are, are, are really completely and totally inaccurate. And we need to kind of throw all those out. But all of that stuff kind of gets piled in our minds. Or, or even worse, the, the, the Catholic Church has kind of poured on all this, this stuff about Mary and, and, and kind of twisted and warped all kinds of stuff. And so we have to strip all that stuff off to, to come to an understanding of, of, of who this girl is. Betrothal typically took place between the ages of 12 and 13 years old. So Mary was probably, most scholars would agree, that she was probably around 12 years old when the angel came to her. Now, I don't know if you had the joy and privilege of having a 12-year-old in your home at this point, or possibly you've had a 12-year-old in your home, but we have the privilege of having a 12-year-old young lady in our house. We just had a sleepover birthday party for her not too long ago, and we had all these 12-year-old all these girls yelling and screaming around our house. And as I'm studying this week and I'm looking at this, I, I'm like double-taking and going, I mean, you have to stop and think about that for a moment, that what is taking place here is happening to a young lady a te who's maybe not even a teenager yet, 12, 13, 14, maybe up to the age of 16, but but very few scholars would say that she could be any older than 16 years old. 12 to 16 years old. And she is promised the most amazing, amazing blessing ever. You think God is, is, is making a point, in a sense here, with Nazareth and with a young teenage girl 
from a poor family and a poor background and a poor situation. So God, God, we, we talked about it last week. God does not look at the standards of this world and he does not have the same standards that we have. He does, not have. he does not value the same things that we value. We value power and position and money and these things are so important to us. And God says, I'm gonna send my son into the world to a poor family in a nowhere location because I want you to understand that the only way you come to me is through absolute humility. And so my son will example humility. He will be the model of humility. And all those who follow after me will walk in those footsteps of humility. You see, there is no pride in the kingdom of God. None. And what an incredible picture for us to see. Ken Hughes is a, is a pastor and a scholar, and he, he says this about Mary. He says, from all indicators, her life would not be extraordinary. She would marry humbly, give birth to numerous poor children, never travel farther than a few miles from home, and one day die like thousands of others before her. She was a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. Do you, do you get that? Do you see that? What God is trying to show us and teach us? This theme that he comes to lowly people. He comes to humble people. He comes to brokenhearted people with the gospel. Secondly, the gospel is a gift of sovereign grace. The gospel is a gift of sovereign grace. Look at verse 28 with me. And the angel, he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. He says, Greetings. Now, the, the root of this word greetings is, is the root for the word grace in the Greek. And then the word O favored one is actually grace to you. And so he says, he comes to Mary and he says, grace as a greeting, grace to you as a greeting, and, and the Lord is uh, going to give you grace. God is about to show you grace like nobody in the world has ever seen or known. You are going to be the recipient of God's amazing grace, Mary. And so she responds, verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, now, when the angel appeared to her, obviously, he did not appear to her in some kind of glorious form like he could have, because a 12 year, it would have scared a 12-year-old girl to death, right? So, like many other times in the Old Testament, most likely, the angel appeared in some kind of human form, and so she might have been greatly troubled just because there was a strange man standing next to her talking to her, or maybe even in her house talking to her. But probably more likely, what, what Luke is trying to get across here is that she's troubled by this idea of grace. She's troubled that the angel is saying, God is going to lavish grace upon you. You are about to be the recipient of God's amazing grace, Mary. And she was troubled by that. Why? The same reason you and I would be troubled by somebody saying that. If, if an angel showed up to you and said, listen, you are going to be a recipient of God's amazing grace today, your immediate response would be, I'm not worthy. God, you know me. You know my heart. I don't deserve your grace. I'm not worthy of your grace. Like Isaiah, if we stood in the presence of a holy being, we would say, God, I, I can't look upon you. I can't talk. I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. I am unholy. What can you have to do with me? See, I think that's what Mary is so troubled about, is this idea that God would give her, as a young girl, this amazing grace. But the angel says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found 
favor with God. He reminds, says, look, don't, don't be afraid because it's not about you. It's about God's amazing grace. Do you notice what's missing here? You notice that there's no statement of Mary's righteousness. He doesn't come and say, Mary, you've been chosen because God looked through all the world and he found the best person and the most righteous person and you're the winner. You got the lucky golden ticket. He says, you have become a recipient of God's amazing grace today, Mary. That's amazing. See, the, the thing we see in the gospel is that is that God offers his amazing grace to you and to I. And the, and the reality is the same here, that we do not deserve it. There's not one person in here that, that is worthy of God's amazing grace. It is a free gift that God graciously gives because of his amazing love and because of his amazing mercy. There's nothing that Mary had done to merit this. And whenever God gives his grace, it is only because of his sovereign love. Ephesians 2 is, is such a, a powerful picture to us. Ephesians 2, you can jot it down, maybe talk about it in your community groups this week. Verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, it's everywhere in the scripture, and we see it in this story right here, that God sovereignly loves people because of his amazing grace, not because of anything they've done. You see, the difference between religion and Jesus is that religion says, if I just do enough, if I'm good enough, then, I, then God will like me, then I will be acceptable to God. And so I keep striving and striving and striving so I can meet some kind of standard so that God can accept me. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is called the good news, because that's exactly what it is, says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God was gracious to you. That God looked down, that he saw sinful humanity, and that he provided a way that humanity could never provide on their own. That he sent his perfect righteous son, who would come and live a perfect righteous life, and then he would die for our sins and in our place, for us, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, that's why it's the good news. That's why it's the gospel. That's why it's not about what we do to meet God's standards. It's about what God has done so that we might be made righteous in his sight through his son, Jesus. The gospel is about God's amazing, sovereign love. Thirdly, the gospel offers a savior who is king. The gospel offers a savior who is king. Verses 31 through 33, the angel begins to explain this amazing grace that she is going to receive. Verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. The name Jesus itself, it means the Lord is my salvation. He says, you will have a son and your son will be the savior and he goes on to say he will be the savior of all of the world. Verse 32, he will be great. This is a characteristic of God himself. In the Old Testament, when you find that, that there's something that said, and, and, and God is great, this is a characteristic that's only given to God. And so he's saying, in, you know, John would be great before men, but Jesus would just be great because he is God and he will be called the son of the most high. This is messianic language. This is language that points to and helps Mary understand that this son who would be the savior 
is the promised Messiah. I mean, Calvin alluded to it. We sang about it. That, that for all of the Old Testament, people were waiting. See, in Genesis, from the very beginning, in Genesis, man disobeyed and rebelled and sinned against God. And so they were separated from God. And there was a divide between God and between man. But God provided a way. And in the Old Testament, he provided a way for people to demonstrate their faith in him through symbols, through sacrifice, that they would sacrifice animals. But all of that was symbolic because one day the real sacrifice would be given. It would be the atonement of Jesus Christ. His blood would be shed and once for all, sin would be paid for. And so he is promised as the son of the Most High the promised Messiah, the one they had been waiting for, Mary would bear this Savior and this King. And the, and the Lord would give to him the house, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. She says, he says to her, you will bear a, a son. He will be the savior. He will be the savior over all of Israel, over all of Jacob. He will be the savior over all of the world and his kingdom will never end. You see, the gospel is about a promise. It was about a promise fulfilled. It was about a promise of a savior and if you haven't realized yet, if you haven't recognized yet, you can not save yourself. There's no hope. Jesus will either be your savior or he will be your judge. One day you, we will all stand before the righteous king Jesus. And we will give an account for all that we've done. And our lives will not be based upon our standards of what right and wrong is and what we think today oh I think today I think this is a good thing or this is a bad thing it will be based on God's perfect holiness which he has outlined some of it for it help us understand just take a look at the Ten Commandments and test yourself against the Ten Commandments have you worshiped anything other than God have you ever spoken falsehood have you ever, and you go, well, nobody could live up to that. You are exactly right. Nobody could live up to that except for Jesus. And so, because God is perfectly holy and perfectly just, and he must punish sin, he made a way through his son, Jesus, who would be the savior. And the question is, is he your savior? He's the savior of the world. He's the savior of Israel. But the question, the real question is, is he your savior? Have you placed your faith and your trust in him alone? Fourthly, the gospel requires faith. We see in this picture an incredible, in this story, an incredible picture of faith. And we see that the gospel requires faith. Verse, verse 34 and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a, a virgin? Now, when you look at this, you might think that this is exactly kind of what, what Zachariah had said. But the reality is, is that the way that she says this is different than Zachariah. Zachariah said, I don't believe this can happen. Show me a sign. And Mary says, how? I, I want to believe. I, I believe what you're saying to me. But, but how? How is this possible? I, I mean, the angel must have said it in a way. There must have been, uh, many scholars think the tense that's used here gives inference to this. But there must have been a, a way that the angel said it that she believed that he was saying that very soon, right now or very soon, you are going to conceive a child. And her mindset is how? I've never been with a man. I'm not married yet. How is this even possible? But notice what she doesn't say. She doesn't say, that's impossible. But she says, Lord, how? I believe what you say, but I, I have questions about it. 
and that is faith. That's faith. What an incredible picture of faith. Maybe even, we could even say here, a childlike faith that God calls us to have, to trust and to believe. Even when we don't understand, we don't understand the, the how, we don't understand the what, we don't understand the where and the why, God rarely gives that and he says to do something and our response needs to be, okay, Lord, show me how. How do I do this? And that's exactly what she did. She had faith. In verse 35, the angel answered her, and he tells her. He doesn't answer everything for her. He doesn't tell her exactly how it's going to happen. He just says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of of God. He says it's going to be a miracle. The language that's used here kind of refers to the idea of the Shekinah glory coming down upon the temple. It's just that the presence of God will rest upon you in some special way that only God knows. And just like the beginning of all of creation was a miracle, so will the creation of the Son of God be a miracle. And it will require faith. Listen. The Christian life requires faith. It is a life of faith. It's not blind faith, as we'll see. He provides a way for her to, to have, have some, some confirmation in her heart and things that she knows, and she knows that God's faithfulness has been proven throughout time and history. It's not a blind faith, but it is faith. And don't let anyone ever tell you that their belief system is based in fact and yours is based in faith. Because the reality is all of the most important things in life, why are we here? Why do we exist? How did creation happen? How did all of this come into being? All of it comes down to faith. Now, some of it's faith in God. That's what we believe, faith in God, a God who spoke the world into existence and created everything. And, and some of it's faith that nothing became nothing out of nothing. And, and to be honest, I, the atheists that I've talked to, I just tell them, listen, you have a whole lot more faith than I do in a lot of ways. I mean, the fact that you can believe that nothing came out of nothing that came out of nothing and there, that just somehow happened out of nothingness the belief that God, the belief the scripture gives us is that there is a God outside of what we see and what we understand and that God who is far beyond our comprehension outside of us spoke everything to existence. So he has always been. He's always been. But both of it takes faith. The Christian life takes faith. And the incarnation takes faith. Now, the amazing thing here is that many people will struggle with the, the birth of Jesus and say, well, how can a virgin give birth to a baby? That's just hogwash, whatever. How, you have to have incredible faith for that. But you know what is even more faith? More faith is that God became man. See, the virgin birth, I mean, that, yeah, that's a miracle. But the real faith, the real miracle is that Jesus came in the form of a baby, lived a perfect life and died the death that you and I deserved. The incarnation itself, that is the true miracle. And then he gives her some, some, some evidence. She doesn't even ask for the evidence, but he gives it to her. Verse 36, and behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, she's also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called Baron. Now she doesn't ask for a sign, but the angel says, look, I'm going, to, I'm going to bolster your faith. Mary, it's amazing that you have this kind of faith as a young girl. I'm going to bolster your faith. Your great aunt, or whoever Elizabeth was to, to, to marry, she is beyond childbearing age, and she is with child. And we'll see that next week as they come together. God gives incredible testimony to her to bolster her faith. And isn't it true that God gives us that as well? people in our lives that we see, even our own testimony, and then the scripture itself is filled with testimonies of people that God has been faithful to. The gospel requires faith. And sometimes God is going to change 
the direction of your life. See, Mary was just living her life, going along her normal pattern. God shows up, says, you're going to be a recipient of my grace, and it's going to change your life. And we're going to see in a moment how radically that's going to change her life. And she responds in simple, obedient faith. And that is to be our response as well. The fifth thing is that the gospel accomplishes the impossible. This is probably the coolest verse in this section. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. You should, you should write that verse down somewhere. You should highlight that verse. You should put that on your mirror. Have that pop up on your phone. Make that a screensaver. Do something so that you remember this verse. That you remember that nothing is impossible with our God. You see, this Christmas, as we go and sit around this story, as we tell this story to our children, as we say, listen, God came to earth as a man. He was born through a virgin. Do you realize if God did that, there's nothing impossible for him. There's no challenge that you're going to face that God cannot walk you through in faith. There's no circumstance that you're going to encounter that God is not with you. Nothing is impossible with God. See, the, the, the biggest miracle here is that, is that God would save sinful humanity. And if God can do that, and if God loves us that much to sacrifice his son on our behalf, then no matter what we face, no matter what, no matter what we encounter, no matter what we go through, we must remember that God loves me and that nothing is impossible with him. And then the final thing is this. The gospel is received through humble submission. The gospel is received through humble submission submission. Look at this incredible response of this young teenage girl. Verse 38. And Mary said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She says, I am a servant. That word servant means bond servant or literally slave. She says, Lord, I am your bondservant. I am your slave. And whatever you want to do with my life, go ahead. I will walk in obedient faith. Let it be to me according to your word. I mean, this is amazing, amazing faith from a young teenage girl. Now, what would this mean? What were these words that she was saying? What did it actually mean for her to be found with child and, 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 and to not have an explanation for that other than to say an angel appeared to me and told me I was going to have a baby, right? Like that doesn't go over too well with parents, right? That doesn't go. Now, now thankfully, God sent an angel to Joseph so that Joseph knew and understood that this was of the Lord, but nobody else did. Nobody else had that, that kind of encounter. And so, so think about it. For the rest of her life, she walked through life in a small village. Think about this. Small village, 50 to 100 people. Everybody knows each other. Everybody knows everybody's family. Everybody has celebrations together. When the celebration happens, the whole village comes together. And Mary would now be the object of ridicule the object of shame. And she didn't have anything to be ashamed of, but those that looked at her and didn't believe her story. See, what she was risking was actually the fact that she could have been divorced by Joseph. She could have even been stoned to death because of the adultery that they would have accused her of. She would have lived and suffered a life of ridicule and, and insult. And then as we do read in, 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 in the life of Mary and Joseph, their, their life was not easy. Their life was difficult. It was a difficult 
pregnancy. We'll get to that. We'll see that. But this is a difficult pregnancy. Being born in the most humble, ridiculous circumstances that none of us would wish upon anybody. Definitely not our own children. Not one of us would wish upon our children the kind of circumstances that they walk through. The journey to Bethlehem, the exile into Egypt, the hatred by the king, Herod. And then one day she would watch this blessed son that she had raised, that she had cared for. She would watch him be falsely accused, arrested, beaten, and executed for the salvation of the world. You see, the life that God was calling her to was not a simple one. It was not an easy one. It was not a life free of suffering. It was a life of grace that God had called her to. And her response was obedience and faithfulness. And I was just incredibly challenged this week. Looking at the faithfulness, the faith of this young girl, and thinking about, I was a youth pastor for a number of years, thinking like the faith of this teenager, this 12, 13, 14 year old girl had faith that most of us don't even come close to. But if we have this kind of childlike faith, this kind of trust in our God, then nothing is impossible with our God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this example. Thank you for this example in Scripture like so many others of those that you showed amazing grace to that responded in humble obedience. God, may they be an encouragement to us. May they be a reminder to us that whatever circumstances that we face, that God, that we would have this kind of response that we would remember through this Christmas season, we would remember Mary, we would remember her response, and that we would have that same kind of response of humble, obedient faith in you and in your will and in your plan. Father, that doesn't happen naturally, and so we ask God that your Holy Spirit would grant us that ability. Thank you, God, that nothing is impossible. Father, I pray for those that are, that are in here right now that are struggling with things, Lord, that are, that are dealing with very difficult circumstances that are possibly are dealing with, with, with sin that they are just being dominated by. God, I pray that they would understand that nothing is impossible with God. I pray that today that we would come in humble obedience to you and walk in faithfulness according to your word. Lord, we love you, but we only love you because you first loved us in Christ Jesus. It's in his name that we pray, amen.